Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to the Lord. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlooker should laugh at him and say, this one began to build, but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king, marching into battle, would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops? But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, any one of you who does not renounce all of his possessions cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Our first reading from the Book of Wisdom begins by asking a simple question. Who can know the intentions of God? Who can divine the will of the Lord? Very good questions. And these are questions we really need to take to heart. Because these days, you think that everyone out there is claiming to know the mind of God. Islamic terrorists are wholeheartedly convinced that God wants them to destroy, for, destroy everyone from the earth who doesn't share their narrow vision or value system. This is also true of Christian terrorists who use the Bible to justify their actions. In some books of the Old Testament, how many times does God order the Jews to commit genocide? Destroy an entire race. God orders Saul to destroy the Amalek people. God orders David to destroy the Philistines. God orders Joshua to destroy the inheritance of Jericho and leave no survivors. I remember a group years ago who, who, who called themselves the Phineas Priests. They were a group of Christian extremists who detonated bombs at abortion clinics while people were in the building. They assassinated abortion doctors in drive-by shootings. And they got their name from Moses' grandson, Phineas, who on the plains of Moab witnessed one of his kinsmen fornicating with a Moabite woman in front of everyone. Phineas, in a fit of rage, grabs a spear and with a single thrust impales them both on it. And God rewarded him for it. God said, not only is the, the priesthood going to be confined to the tribe of Levi, but the office of high priest will pa be passed on to the descendants of Phineas because he was jealous for my sake. And this quote-unquote Christian group use that passage of scripture as a justification for what they were doing until the FBI finally discovered the leaders and shut them down. So there's a danger in making God into whoever we want him to be. So God does not create us in him, his image, rather we create him in ours. That is the form of idolatry that has gripped our modern age. And we see this all over the place. People claiming to know the mind of God. The Westboro Baptist Church basically claims that everybody goes to hell who doesn't belong to their congregation of about 50 people. Everybody else in the world condemned. They're the ones who show up at the funerals of servicemen and the funerals of the other public events and they're screaming out to people that they're going to hell. You may have seen them in the news. Catholic Church never claims this. We have never put anybody in hell. We've never said Adolf Hitler is in hell. We've never said that Nero Caesar is in hell. We don't even put Judas Iscariot in hell. The Catholic Church does say, yes, souls that die in a state of mortal sin go to hell. But we've never pointed at an individual and say, we know that person is in hell. Never. Because we never presume to second guess the mercy of God. Psychics claim to know the mind of God because they claim to know the future. Leaders throughout history have claimed to know the mind of God. Many false prophets and false mystics have claimed to know the mind of God. Now you may be thinking, but Father, doesn't the Catholic Church do the same thing and claim to know the mind of God? No, actually we don't. We've never made that claim. To claim to know the will of God is... The, to claim to know the will of God... Uh, wait a minute. 
Let me start that over again. <laughs> We've never made that claim. Okay. We claim to know the will of God on moral issues. But that's different from saying that we know the mind of God. Because to say you know the mind of God means you know God's plans. The Catholic Church has always maintained that God is mysterious. And being mysterious, God is out of the realm of human comprehension. Therefore, nobody can ever really know the mind of God. How can we then claim to know the will of God on moral issues? Two reasons. First, the scripture. But secondly, and more importantly, God has left us an authoritative body the bishops as successors of the apostles, whose job it is to interpret the scriptures and apply them to different situations throughout the ages. Because as I pointed out, anyone can pull scripture out of context to justify any number of horrible deeds. The teaching authority of the bishops interpret and apply. Therefore, we can claim to objectively know the will of God on moral issues not the mind of God. So, the book of wisdom written to help us main, uh, attain wisdom begins this passage by telling us that the beginning of wisdom lies in not knowing, but in, in, in admitting that we don't know. Wisdom begins with the admission that there is an intelligent force that formed and guides creation, and this force is beyond our understanding. That's where wisdom begins. Wisdom grows when we choose to seek that which we cannot understand and try to understand it anyway. So wisdom begins with the admission that there is a God. Wisdom continues with the admission that God is greater than our understanding. And wisdom grows in seeking an understanding that we'll never fully grasp. Jesus said today, if a man comes to me without hating, hating, his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life too, cannot be my disciple. Whoa, that's harsh. I, fa I, I fancy myself a disciple of the Lord, but I got news for you, Jesus. I don't hate my parents. They get on my nerves every now and then, but I certainly don't hate them. And to be very honest, I highly doubt that Jesus hated Mary and Joseph. Jesus is using hyperbole here, a gross exaggeration to make a point. We cannot be disciples. The Lord doesn't want us as disciples unless we're going to be fully committed to him. Jesus has to be the top priority in our lives. The Lord must be such a priority that if it came down to a choice between our parents, our spouses, our kids, or God, God is going to win, hands down. How many parents, and this might seem to go without saying, but how many parents let their kids get away with things they know are wrong because they want, to be kid, they want to be friends with their kids instead of being their parents? That's failing in discipleship because now you've let somebody else take Jesus as place as Lord of your life. I went to seminary with a few guys that were disowned by their parents for wanting to be priests. God was their priority. And yet many people won't offend Jesus in front of family and friends for fear of ridicule. In my 27 years of ministry, and I count not only priesthood here, but also my years as a youth minister, as a layman, I've known so many young people who are absolutely on fire for God until the new boyfriend or the new girlfriend who was not a believer entered their lives and suddenly God was out the window. When it came to the choice between God and the honey bunch... God lost. That's a failure of discipleship. And it's often casually shrugged out off as, oh, God will understand. God will forgive me. Forgetting that Jesus also said, if you deny me before others, I will deny you before the Father. If we fail to give Christ priority in our lives, we fail to be disciples, and so we fail to be wise. We fail to be wise because we presume to know the mind of God, and we fail to be wise because we don't stand up for God. Abraham Lincoln once said, evil triumphs only when good men do not speak. There is no such thing as a mute disciple. We have an, an obligation to challenge. We have an obligation to speak. We have an obligation to defend our faith. Okay, then. 
How do we seek the Lord so we have the strength to defend, our, uh, to defend his name and truly become wise? That's the easiest question of all. We seek the Lord through imitation. We seek the Lord by seeking to become godly. Jesus gave us his word in scripture, his body and blood and the sacraments and his example, all for the purpose that we might become like him. What is the quickest route to that? Mercy. Practice mercy, forgiveness, charity, and you will become godly. Three different evangelists quote one line of Jesus in three different ways. At the conclusion of the Sermon of the Mount, St. Matthew has Jesus saying, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. St. Mark, in his gospel, translates that differently. He said, Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. St. Luke recorded it differently. He said, Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. What happened? Which one of them is right? Did they mess up? Were they not paying attention? Did they not take good notes? Not at all. Because those are three ways of saying the exact same thing. Perfection is holiness. And holiness grows out of mercy. The three are inseparable. And our second reading today, we hear a passage from one of Paul's last letters before his execution in Rome. His letter to Philemon, in which he's writing about mercy. Onesimus is a runaway slave, and he's run to Paul, who knew his master. And Paul sends him back to Philemon, even though he admits that he would have liked Onesimus to stay with him, to keep him company in prison, because he was lonely. But he tells Philemon, not only don't punish Onesimus for running away. But welcome him back as a brother in Christ and not a slave anymore. Here we have one of the earliest social justice equality letters in all of history. And we know Philemon did what Paul said and did give Onesimus his freedom. Because Onesimus went on to become a bishop in the first century church. We know that because we have one of Bishop Onesimus' letters in the divine office, which all priests and religious pray around the world every day. Philemon began his road to wisdom by accepting the preaching of the apostles and becoming a Christian. Philemon proved his wisdom because he conceded to Paul's authority as an apostle and didn't pretend to know the mind of God himself. And Philemon grew in wisdom by seeking the Lord and showing mercy on another. That's wisdom. And my prayer today, my brothers and sisters, is that we all become so wise. And blessed be God forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.